See what the Lord will do. Amen. That's your word, Lord. Page six of your programs. Page six of your programs. Uh, that's uh, our responsive reading. Taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 20 through 29. Mark's Gospel. As we continue looking at this uh, tremendous account. They brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, I said evil spirit, okay? Immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus said to Father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. Listen at this father's heart. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. I know I'm preaching already. That, that's what Satan wants to do with our children. This is just a small child here. Listen to what he said. But if you can do anything, Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. I need you to read that one more time and read it. Listen, I need you to read it with the exclamation point and read it like Jesus really said it. Will you read it like that? Let's read it like he really said it. Go ahead. child cried out and said I believe help my unbelief
feeling of my mind, my emotions, and my will. Only then can preaching take place. My heart is burdened to preach this passage. Give me grace to preach it. I pray for the hearers of your word. I don't know the mix of this crowd. Some saved, some perhaps not saved. My desire is that all be saved. That all come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. Sanctify the saved. Grow us in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Deliver out of darkness those who are not saved. This is my request. This is what I'm asking all so that everyone at the end of this message all of our fingers pointed in one direction declaring from the very lips of our soul to God be the glory for the great things you have done. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We started looking at this wonderful account and from the theme, Jesus can work it out. Jesus can work it out. Anybody know that to be true? Yes. And again, it's true whether you believe it or not. <laughs> Jesus can work it out. And we started looking in verses 14 through 19, Sunday before last. And in verses 14 through 19, I sought to lift up uh, this main point in your hearing, the lack of spiritual power. And when I'm speaking of the lack of spiritual power, I'm talking about the lack of spiritual power that the disciples of Jesus lacked when they sought to try to cast out this demon and could not. We pick up in verse 14 from last week, there was a dispute over spiritual power. Remember the scribes were, were, were arguing with the disciples when Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, came back down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They came down from glory back into the valley to meet death and defeat and failure. Yes, sir. We saw the delight when Christ arrives. Uh, the, the, the people, the crowd, verse 15, immediately ran up to greet Christ. That ought to be a real spiritual delight because of Christ. I'm not saying that this was with this crowd, but I am saying there ought to be a real spiritual delight because of the presence of Christ. Then we saw in verse 16, and it continued this point to verse 19, the dissecting of the confusing situation how did Jesus seek to dissect this situation? He did it by asking a question. It was not a, a it was not, it was not a hard question. He simply asked, What are you arguing about with them? The question was addressed to the scribes. The question was Jesus standing up to defend his disciples against the malicious attack from the scribes. Yes, yes, the disciples had failed. But how many of you know that Jesus defends failures? <laughs> it's Jesus redirecting a question saying, talk to me. But the question also, verse 17 and 18, drew out the pain of the Father. Yes. Because the Father began to talk. Mm -hmm. Nobody answered when Jesus asked, what are you arguing about? The scribes didn't answer because they know they can't deal with Jesus. Amen. So this hurt 
father answers. And we hear his pain in verse 17 when he talks about his son. We hear his disappointment in verse 18. He said, I brought him to your disciples and they could not cast it out. He's disappointed. He's hurt. And remember I tell you, never expect ultimate satisfaction even from the church. You can only get ultimate satisfaction from Jesus. Right? Then we saw in verse 19 the lament because of unbelief. Jesus lamented over this faithless generation. It was a very painful lament. But there was a promise with it. And I ended there because Jesus said, bring the boy to me. That brings us to where we are today. And I want you to look in verses 20 through 24. I want you to look at this point, the Lord of spiritual comfort. Does anyone here need comfort today? The Lord of spiritual comfort. Notice what happens in verse 20. And they brought the boy to, to him, meaning Jesus. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. Notice what's, going, no, notice what's going on here, and I want you to think with me how the Lord Jesus brings comfort to us. Amen. He does not bring comfort the way we think. He does not bring comfort the way we think. We think of comfort, everything's going to be okay. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That's not how he brings comfort. Notice how he brings comfort. First of all, Jesus confronts the demon. Doesn't he? <laughs> In verse 19, Jesus commands, bring the boy to me. In verse 20, and they brought the boy to him. Jesus confronts the demon. And in confronting the demon, Jesus confronts his disciples' failures. Jesus confronts the father's pain. Jesus confronts the boy's bondage. Listen, spiritual comfort only happens when we confront our problems, not when we ignore them. <laughs> Anybody here with me? Jesus confronts the problem. Notice what happens. And when the spirit saw him, that's the evil spirit in the boy, immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. The spirit sees Jesus, and there's conflict. He's confronted by Jesus and the spirit immediately. That evil spirit, that demon, threw that boy into a convulsion. Remember, this is a child. How many of you know the devil doesn't care? I said it last time and I'll say it again. The devil doesn't care how young your child is. He'll get him. He'll go after him. He'll go after him and watch this through social media. He'll go after them through relationships. He'll go after them through the, the three avenues, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He, he, he threw the boy to the ground, and the child is foaming at the mouth. When did he do this? He did this when he saw Jesus, which tells us something else. The demon recognized who was standing in front of him. You know what else the demon understands? He's about to lose control of this victim. So he, he vented his rage. He can't vent his rage against Jesus because he can't handle Jesus. 
He vented his rage on the boy and he throws him into a complete convulsion. That word convulse speaks of the intensity of this tearing. He's tearing the boy grievously. The boy falls. He's wallowing on the ground. He's foaming at the mouth. He's rolling continuously. He's twisting and rolling and twisting and rolling while foaming at the mouth. Yeah. Right in front of Jesus. Yeah. Let's learn before I go to the next verse. Let's learn. I told my discipleship group on Wednesday. Preaching is no good if it doesn't make sense. All right. Right? I just, I, I, I've been hearing about responses from Pastor H.B. Charles, his message, Dr. Lawson, uh, Pastor Axon. You know, you know why? Because when they preach, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's learn, all right? Mm -hmm. First of all, let's learn this. The mission of Jesus is to confront and defeat the powers of evil. Come on, come on. Okay. He was confronted in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 in the wilderness by the devil. Guess who won? Amen. Jesus. His chief mission is to bind the strong man, the devil, and to liberate all of the captives that he chooses to deliberate. So, notice, the initial result of the presence of Christ here in this account is not peace, it's conflict, it's not resurrection, it's suffering. The initial result. And I say to you, the, the presence of God can cause a storm. It can cause a storm. You have to listen to me preach. Have you ever brought your problems to Jesus and the problem got worse? Oh, I don't have any honest people here this morning. I wish I had some honest people with me. Right? And sometimes I want to warn you that will happen. Bring the boy to me. They bring the boy to Jesus and the problem gets worse. Right? The demon wants one more round. One, one more round of child's play. One more exercise in futility. One final attack on the child's body. But here's the good news that you can take home with you. Amen. Don't fear when the devil roars. Behind every wicked threat is God's sure victory. Satan may throw us into a world, but it's, but it's only a last attack before the word of God brings wholeness and completeness. So I say to you, trust the word of God over what you see. You bring it to Jesus and it gets worse, keep trusting. You know why? Because Jesus can work it out. Jesus came to defeat. Right? But here's an additional lesson you need to learn. Sin must be confronted before there's comfort. All right. Now this might hurt a little bit, but we like comfort without confrontation. That's right, that's right. Come on, <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Bring it out. Say more, nice. Yeah. Right? Amen. We like comfort without confrontation. But, but, but you can't get the comfort of God. You might get false peace. That's no peace. But you can't get the comfort of God in your heart unless your sin is confronted. So where do you see that in the text? It's beaming out of the text. Verse 19, Jesus confronted unbelief. Right? Verse 20, Jesus confronted the sin problem in this boy. Did he 
you now. Now let me give you another another verse to affirm what I just my point. You can't get comfort unless sin is confronted, right? You can just jot it down. Matthew five verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He said it, it doesn't say anything about sin. Pastor it just says blessed are those who mourn. Study the passage. I've actually preached that before. The morning is a morning over sin. Blessed are those who are hurting over their sin. Ready and willing to repent of it. They will get comfort. Have I got any warriors in this house? Why do I continue to feel the way I feel? Because you're holding on to what needs to be confronted. Yeah. Yeah. Give me some warriors in this house. Why do you keep going around the revolving door? Because you will not bring the sin to Jesus. Jesus confronts the demon. He says, I'll bring you comfort. But I, got, I have to confront your sin. Notice, secondly, I, I, I've got to hear through this. Uh, Jesus consults with the Father. Verse 21 and 22. Notice the text. And Jesus asked his Father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Wow. I wonder if anybody today believes what I'm preaching. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, Amen. have compassion on us and help us. Jesus consults with the Father. Why does Jesus consult with the Father? Why didn't Jesus just go ahead and take care of it the moment the demon threw him into convulsion? I'll tell you why. He wants the Father to unveil his heart. Unburden yourself. Recognize the desperate extremity of this problem. Now can you think with me, try, try, try to understand, try to think with me. He's talking to Jesus. The demon has his son rolling around in the floor. Yes, the boy has burn spots on him mm -hmm. from being thrown into the fire, right? And into the water, right? Yeah. He's burned. Spots. Spots. The child is staring up, staring up at his father with terror in his eyes. Mm -hmm. But the child can't talk. Mm -hmm. He can't even hear. Can you imagine? Parents, can you imagine the pain of this father? I remember when my daughters were growing up, I rose and fell with their rejections and successes. There were times, and I remember my daughter Tiffany suffered for the first two years of her life. She suffered from asthma. We were taking her to the emergency room practically every month of the year because she could not breathe. Mm -hmm. There were times when I would have rather suffered severe mm -hmm. physical beating than see her in that condition. Mm -hmm. yes. This man is hurting. Yes. Is anybody hurting mm -hmm. over an unsaved child? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Or have we taken on the thinking of the world? They're unsaved, and I'm just go their way. I, I did everything I can, just, just forget about it. Is anybody hurting over an unsaved child? This man is hurting. But you know, when I read the Gospels, it was something about the eyes of Jesus. 
Pastor. When people, hurting people came to Jesus, it was, even before he spoke, it was something about the very eyes of Jesus. You know, when he, because the, the, the Gospels would tell us over and over again, he looked on them with compassion. It was something about the very eyes of Jesus that people could just see. He was a compassionate person. So he said uh, the, the compassion of Christ actually drew out the cry of his father. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Why, is, why did he say, but if you can do anything? Because those weak infant disciples of Jesus Christ. All right, all right. Because they couldn't heal, they, could, they couldn't cast this demon out. Because they were not effective witnesses of Jesus Christ. Because they weren't believing him and they weren't praying. It cast doubt that Christ could do it. Anybody in here with me? Uh, but the word but actually placed the possible power of Christ over against the need. If you can do anything. He had brought him to his disciples and they couldn't help. And I say to you, before I go any further, your life as a Christian represents Jesus. Yes. Amen. We are ambassadors for Christ. May we not misrepresent him. May we, may we be walking demonstrations of the power of Christ. I go on. Right? He pled with Jesus. If you can, if you're able to do anything, just have compassion on us. Uh, he appeals to the sympathy, the deep sympathy, the deep concern and care in the very inner being of Christ. Have compassion on us. Help us. The word help means cry and run. So I'm crying and I'm running to you. Help us. And notice he said, help us. He didn't say help me. Help us identify with this child's pain. See, that's how you know you're hurting over your children or over others. When their pain, when you identify with their pain. I wish I had somebody else in here with me. Right? When, when you are so identified with their pain and you start talking to the Lord about it. And instead of saying, help them, you say, help us. Because to help the, the child is to help the father. That's how you identify. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, my God. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, help me. Glory to God. I need you to learn though. I want you to notice the sovereign control of Jesus while he's talking with his father. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Do you see it? Will you notice the boys being attacked while Jesus is consulting with the father? You notice that? And, and do you notice what the father said that the, that the boy had been thrown into the fire and a demon was trying to kill him? Jesus is consulting with the father while the demon is attacking his son. Let me raise a question to help you understand the sovereignty of Christ. Should Jesus not be in a hurry? Don't, uh, uh, don't we pray like that sometimes? Oh, uh, uh, we need you to hurry up, Jesus. Jesus, you, you sitting here asking questions and this demon's about to kill my boy. Should Jesus not be in a hurry? No. You know why? You need to listen to this because Jesus is in control even when the demon has the boy rolling on the ground. Come on. Amen, flowers. Yeah. Glory to God. 
See, we like to think of the sovereignty of Christ this way. The company laid me off yesterday. I went and made one application. And I got hired the next day. Jesus is in control. Right? And I agree. Okay? I agree. He is in control. But we don't think of the control of Christ this way. My child is in trouble. My child is being beaten by the devil. Is he still in control? I wish I had somebody in here. The Christ is in control even when the demon has his boy rolling on the ground. Guess why the demon didn't kill him before? Because Jesus was in control. <laughs> I wish I had some lawyers in this house, right? Uh, 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 the sovereignty of Christ is seen in what he allows for his purpose. 9-1-1. He was in control. 9-11, y'all remember 9-11? Y'all remember 9-11? Does anybody here remember? I, I saw 9-11 on television. Jesus was in control. Do I have any warriors in this house? The worst tragedy you can think of in your life, Jesus was in control. He's never not in control. That's why he doesn't have to get in a hurry. Get in a hurry for what? That demon cannot do any more to that child than what Christ allows. Do I have any warriors in this house? Oh, I gotta move on in a moment. Do I have some warriors in this house? So, your child might be in a bad shape right now. But know this, if they're still alive, if they're still alive, if they're still alive, if they're still alive, keep on praying because they can't do any more than what Christ allows. And whatever Christ allows is for his purpose and for his glory. Right? You know why the demon couldn't kill him? Because Christ was saving the boy for this very purpose. Man, Christ is so sovereign, isn't he? He can preserve a child for his purpose with a demon living in him. Y'all didn't hear that. Put it back. I said Christ is so sovereign until he can preserve a child with a demon living in him. I gotta pause and shout for a moment. Because Jesus, he, he ain't doing no flexing now. Glory to God. Glory to the King. Glory to the Lamb. Even with a demon living in him, Jesus kept him. <laughs> Didn't he do it? You can't get comfort without believing in the sovereignty of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Without sovereignty, we will lose our minds. Right? Yes, sir. right? Yes. You learning? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I want you to notice another word of learning. Jesus wants us to unveil our hearts to him. Mm -hmm. Is that what the Father does? Yes. Just watch it. He talks about how long the demon had been attacking his son. He talks about the effects of the demon's attack. He talks, uh, he expresses the pain he felt because of his situation. Everybody okay so far, aren't you? Because Jesus wants us to unveil our hearts, right? He expresses the doubt mm -hmm. to Jesus that he can help him. Yes, sir. He said, I'm not going to talk to Jesus like that. If there's doubt in your heart and you don't talk to him like that, you're lying. Jesus doesn't answer the prayer of a lying tongue. Right? right. right? If there's doubt in your heart, you need to express it. Mm -hmm. Why would I need to express it? Because he's the only one that can deal with it. <laughs> right? Jesus says, I want you to unveil your hearts to me, resurrected Baptist Church, because Peter wrote, cast all your cares upon me, because Jesus cares for you. You have to be honest and unveil your heart if you want comfort. 
right? I want you to notice the third thing about this comfort. Not only does Jesus confront the demon, he, he consults with the Father, but look at verse 23 and 24. Jesus cultivates faith. Jesus starts talking again. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. I need you to notice carefully the words, if you can. Because they, those words are, are key to understanding Jesus. The boy's father just said, if you can, do anything. And Jesus says back in essence, here's what Jesus is saying. You say, if you can to me, but that isn't the issue. <laughs> if you can, it's not the issue. <laughs> the, the Lord Jesus, watch what he does. He exposes the father's doubt and then he turns around and challenges him to believe because you're not going to get any comfort unless we deal with your doubt and, have, uh, and unless you trust in Jesus. Right? Amen. If you can. You don't know who you're talking to. Right. I remember the very, very, very and I don't have, to have time to give you all of the various, okay? But the very, 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 very rare occasions when I chose in my utter foolishness to get smart with my daddy. Wow. And know what he would say? But who do you think you're talking to? Amen. Reminding me that I have forgotten who he is. Wish I had some warriors. And I've forgotten his position in this family. I'm child, he dad. <laughs> I've got any warriors in this house. If you can, do you understand who you're talking to? If you can. You're talking to the one who stepped out on nothing and declared, let that be, and you ask me if you can. Amen. All things are possible for one who believes. So the issue is not Jesus' ability. No. The issue is, are you willing to respond in faith? Now here's the, the point is, listen, the point is not this. The point is not, if you have enough faith, you can do anything. That's not the point. May I say again, that is not the point. May I say one more time, that is not the point. The point is that God has the power to do anything. The, the, the affirmation here does not mean that, 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 accomplish anything, but what it does mean is this, if you trust the Lord, you will, you will set no limits on his power, right? It's not the amount of faith that's important here, it's the object of faith, who is God, who is Jesus here. Jesus says in the parallel account in Matthew 17 and 20, with the faith of a mustard seed, you can speak to the mountains and they will, right? Why? Because you've got enough faith? No, because your faith is in the sovereign Lord of the universe. So the lesson that faith is essential to access the power of God applied to the unbelieving crowd, it applied to the Father, and it applied to all his struggling disciples. Right? That's us too, right? Yes, yes. The just must live by faith. And I say, before I move on, 
because these health and wealth people have so abused this verse. This is one of the most abused verses in the Bible. There, it's being taught today that faith can control God. It's man-made, man-centered, ungodly religion. Listen, faith can't control God. God is the only one in control. Yes. All right. Listen to me carefully. This may hurt a little bit. You can't name it and claim it. Chris, get ready to take over as pastor. <laughs> Faith must never go farther than the clear promises of God. Right? For example, this example is going to hurt. Your parent, I'm a parent, you got a child who's sick, who want him healed. And we say, I believe that Christ can heal him. That's right. We say, I will pray in faith, and I know, I claim the answer in the name of Jesus. That's wrong. Pastor, why would that be wrong? Christ can't heal him. That's right. Why can't I claim the answer in the name of Jesus? Because you don't have a promise in the word of God. There's no promise in the word of God that Jesus will heal anybody. Right? Show it to me. You can stop my sermon right now and show it to me. There's no promise in the word of God that Jesus will heal anybody. Right? Not one promise. Well, I, I see all these people. He healed uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I see all of those people. He healed. Yes. Yes, you do. But there's no promises that he will heal anybody unless he first makes it to them. When he said, bring the boy to me, he was saying he's going to heal him. But you don't have a promise that you can claim from Scripture that God will heal anybody. But don't set a limit on him. Amen. Amen. Don't set a limit on me and say, well, since I don't have a promise, that means he can't. Oh no, he can heal. Absolutely. My daughter Tiffany is sitting here because she's been healed from asthma. Amen. My daughter Tilia was uh, uh, epileptic and she was healed. Yes. But I couldn't name it and claim it. See, you, you gotta understand that there's no promise you can't claim it. You can trust God to do it, but if God chooses not to do it, don't say he's not able. That's the other extreme. God is always able, right? God is always able. And, and, and God is saying to us, great things can take place in our lives if we just believe in him. Yeah. Yeah. Why is he told to believe then, Pastor? Because that's, con that's the condition that Jesus laid down right here in this text. Jesus says, if you believe, and guess what? If the man doesn't believe, his son is not going to get delivered. Because Jesus laid down the condition, you have to believe. Just like if you don't believe, you won't get saved. Because faith is a condition, right? You must trust in Christ. Have I got any warriors here? Now look what happens when Jesus challenges his faith, cultivating his faith. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. What did he do? He cried out, didn't he? Wait a minute. Is he crying out now for his son? No, 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 no. He says, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. 
help my doubt that I just talked about. I believe, help my weakness that uh, you just exposed. I believe. But mixed in my belief is unbelief. Wow. I wonder if I ask you, would you tell me the truth? How many of you have a perfect faith that doesn't have even a smidgen of doubt in it? Come on. Don't raise your hand up in here. Yeah. Uh, it, it would not be wise to raise your hand. This man's faith is growing, you know how I know? Because when he says, I believe, help my unbelief, by faith, he's expressing the weakness that is within him. Have I got any warriors here? I know, I know it's growing. He, he, he realizes that in order for me to really trust you the way I should trust you right now, I'm gonna have to have you to help me with my unbelief. Glory to God. Glory to the Lamb. Have I got anybody in here? I need you to help me with my unbelief. Amen. Anybody in here with me? Aren't you glad that the Lord is not limited by imperfect faith? Oh, I'm so glad. I, I, I'm so glad about that. He says, I believe. I believe. My faith is mixed with some doubt. I, I need you to help my unbelief. So I'm going to bring my insufficiency to the sufficient one. Sometimes we beat people up too much. Sometimes we beat people up too much. Sometimes we beat people up too much and say, da, boom, 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 boom. Jesus didn't do that. Amen. Oh, sir. Have I got any warriors here? Oh, I probably won't finish one. But real faith doesn't put confidence in itself. Real faith rests in Christ. I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I'm honest. I'm open. I know you see my heart. I know you know I got some doubt. I know you see the unbelief in my heart. I do believe, but I'm bringing it all to you. Help my unbelief. Amen. You know why Jesus can help unbelief? Because Jesus <laughs> can work it out. Yes, sir. Yes. It's not how large your faith is. It's how great your Savior is. <laughs> Right? It's not how large your faith is. It's how great your Savior is. I believe. You say, well, this guy will never get an answer from Jesus talking like that. Guess what the health, wealth, false gospel preachers want you to believe? Oh, uh, the reason you can't get an answer because your faith is not strong enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not it. Not it. That's not it. Growing faith confesses weakness. Yeah. That's not it at all, at all. And I wish all of their false churches would close down. Mm -hmm. They're misleading people, making them twice as much as sons of hell yeah. through their false teaching. Yeah. Lord, help me. Please. Are you with me? Amen. I believe. Help my unbelief. Yes, sir. Is anybody here that honest with God? Yeah. You ever read the Psalms? Mm -hmm. The Psalm, the Psalms is that honest with God when he's going through difficulty. Yes. Yes. Lord, help me. Don't seem like you're blessing me, Lord. You so said you can't talk to God like that. That's Psalm 40, yes, he did. Right? Lord, help me. I know I'm a Christian. And I know I believe in Jesus. But I tell you what, I don't have a 
perfect faith. And I don't always trust him the way I should. And I am not proud of that. There are times when your pastor has unbelief. Stop thinking of pastors as some superhero. We're just another disciple of Christ trying to follow him. Right? Help my unbelief. Sometimes I'm angry with God. And I'm not talking to him like I would talk to you if I'm angry with you. But I am saying to him, Lord, I really... I'm really angry with what you did. Instead of lying to him and saying, Lord, you've been so good to me. You've been so merciful and kind. That's what's going on in my heart right now. And I just want to express that to you. And I can see God sitting there and saying, well, why don't you tell me about that anger? Amen. So I can help you with that anger. Yes. Don't you want to help with that anger? You're talking about how good I am and how merciful I am. But you ain't said a word about that anger, and I'm your father. Yeah. And we're in an intimate relationship with one another. And you're supposed to be communing with me and having fellowship with me. And you're supposed to be open and honest and unveiling your heart to me. I'm supposed to be the person that you can tell anything. And you still haven't said anything about that anger. All you're talking about is how good I am. Stop lying and start talking about, no, not lying in terms of God is good. God is good. But stop lying about what's really going on in your heart and start talking to me about what's going on. Get real with God. Right? If you have unbelief, express it to God. That's why we sometimes continue doubting, doubting, doubting because we never bring it to Jesus. We never bring it to Jesus. The only one who can grow our faith is Jesus. So bring your unbelief to him. So Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Are you with me? Uh, I can't. I, I better stop right there. Yeah, I better stop right there. I can't. I can't do justice and finish this. The Lord of spiritual comfort. You want comfort? Amen. What you learn today, then, if you want comfort? Amen. Gotta confront your sin. Yes. You gotta unveil your heart to Jesus. Right? Expressing what's going on in that heart, even if it's against Christ, express it to Him. And Jesus will cultivate. You got to be willing to accept the challenge now. Jesus exposed the doubt when He says, "If I, if you can." But He doesn't take. He doesn't start beating him over here with a hammer, does He? He exposes the doubt, but He challenges him. And he says, all things are possible for those who believe. Yes, sir. Trust me, hurting father. Trust me, failed disciples. Trust me, unbelieving crowd. I'm not asking for perfect faith. <coughs> Bring your little faith. Yes, sir. To me. Yes, sir. If I'm talking to somebody who says, oh, I need great faith to be saved. There's not a person in this building that they said they're lying. They can tell you they had great faith when they came to Jesus. Nobody did. Nobody did. We came to Jesus weird, moon and sad. Wretched. Right? Yes, sir. And we, the only reason we had any faith is because when he regenerated us, it caused us to be born again. He gave us faith. He gave us the very seed of faith. And we trusted Jesus Christ alone. But nobody came to him like that. So if you're sitting here and you say, man, I need great faith to believe that Jesus can deliver me out of the darkness that I'm in right now. No, you don't. Come to Jesus like this man. Amen. With little faith. 
trusting in the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Yeah, you, you want out, you gotta, your, your sin has to be confronted. So that means you're going to have to repent, turn from your old life, and trust the other side of faith in Christ alone and follow him and live in the newness of life. You got to believe who you're talking to now. It's not dependent on your greatness, it's on his greatness. And he is the only begotten son of the Father. You know that, right? Yes, sir. He is God of very God. You know that, right? But he's also fully man and fully human. Yes, yes. Okay? Dying in your place, taking your wrath, because he's fully God and fully human. Yes, sir. Taking your judgment, dying in your place, for your sins, in your stead. Making atonement unto God yes, for you. Mm -hmm. On that third day morning, Amen. Oh, yes. I'm happy to report. Yes. I believe the report. Yes. You know what the report is? Yes. He got up. Yes. That's the report. Yes. Maybe you're like the other that say, well, his disciples stole his body, so they're lying. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I know if they just stole his body, by now, somebody would have found him. <laughs> right? You know the devil would have found him. <laughs> but you know what? After the third day morning, you all better come on up here. The devil stopped looking for it. You know why the devil stopped looking for it? Because he's not like uh, some of you and some of those people out there. He's not like that. You know why he stopped looking for it? Because he know he got up. Yeah. He know he got up. He know that morning that he got up. He knows he got up. He see him every day. He just trying to convince you to believe. The very opposite. The devil stopped looking because he's... Now you all looking, trying to prove that he didn't get up. I see him. There he is. In the beauty of his holiness. In the majestic glory that is his along. He's seated at the right hand right now. I know he's up because I keep plea. I, I, I keep, uh, uh, every day, I keep on, you know what he does every day? I keep on accusing people. He keep raising them hands. I got any warriors here. He keep raising up those hands. Talking about I died one Friday. Talking about I was wounded. I wish I had somebody in here. I just want you to understand the passage. Talking about I was bruised. Right. He keeps raising those hands. He keeps those hands raised. I, I can't get past those hands. Every time I try to accuse Eddie Donald Jacks, that ain't that ain't handles. That's all right, Christian. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead with communion. Come, come on up, Davis. Every time, keeps raising those hands. 